First, the agreement with the analysis. I think that it's quite clear that the state is back. Uh, not only that, we have uh, political risk is back in the West, not only um, in the emerging markets. Um, and thirdly, we are living a, a period of what might be termed as shock Keynesianism, Keynesianism or shock socialism. Uh, we've seen uh, sort of uh, uh, nationalizations uh, by default because nobody else Nobody knew what else to do. We had to, to nationalize banks and, and um, corporations. When you speak about corporate foreign policy, you speak about a two-way street. Corporations influencing or dealing with governments and vice versa. And I would not do that. I mean, uh, my, my definitions would do, uh, go like this. We have foreign policy, which is relations between states. Then we have corporate foreign policy, which is corporations dealing with states. And thirdly, we have state capitalism, which is states or governments dealing with the market, i.e. market players, corporations. So corporate foreign policy in my books uh, is a, an attempt by corporations to deal uh, in a proactive way, as you indicated, with state actors. So I, I would not take the two-way street approach that you, you, you uh, favored, just because I, would like to, I, I like clarity and I think that's easier to speak of only corporations speaking, uh, uh, trying to come to terms with the uh, political environment in which they are, they are living. It's quite clear that if we compare, for example, Finland and Russia, Finland is not the norm, Russia is the norm. And we, if we look at 190, what, six members of the UN. Uh, there are more countries that are like Russia than there are countries that are like Finland. So in that way, I think it's, it's good to keep in mind that the international environment in which corporations act is very different from what, what it is here in Canada or the, uh, uh, the Nordic countries or, or the West in general. In the 1990s, it's quite what was quite clear that in Hegelian terms, it was corporations that were the theses, the dynamic promoters of change, and then it was the uh, NGOs that were the antithesis, and the state was withering away. Um, and um, during that era, there was very strong criticism, as you indicated, by the NGO sector of the corporate world, yet they managed to influence the corporate agenda enormously. If you started, if you look at the early 1990s, uh, uh, the corporate agenda was very different from what it was at the end of the decade. NGOs had won the battle hands down. Corporations had adopted all the human rights um, uh, aspirations that they were urged to do, all the environmental concerns, social concerns. So that was a great decade for NGOs. Then we come to uh, 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 the terrorist attacks. Uh, uh, then we come to changes in Russia along the way. And we say the state gaining power. The state is back. And this is bad not only for corporations, it's extremely bad for NGOs. So my one message sort of enforcing what you were saying is actually you better be careful with what you wish for. In the 1990s, many NGOs said we need a stronger state, more, uh, stronger political control. This is what we have. We have the state is back, we have stronger political control, and it's very bad for NGOs, it's very bad for corporations. So the balance of power has shifted and, and certainly it's not good news for democracy. My final point has to do with democracy and where we are heading from here is, and it, it, it's, it, I want to go back to the 1930s. Um, there was one country that came out of the Great Depression uh, almost intact and that was the Soviet Union. When we think about the rise of socialism in the 1930s, we should not forget that one reason for the popularity of both the German and the Russian version of, of socialism was that it had a good track record. The Soviet Union had survived the, the crisis better than others. Now if we look at countries that are likely to come out of 
uh, this current crisis in a better shape than others? Well, China comes to mind. And the Chinese model is not a combination of market economy and democracy. It's capitalism without democracy. And this is actually the, 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 the way we're going now. Look at Africa. For ages, for decades, not ages, for 50 years actually, um, uh, Western governments have been pushing an agenda of reform, of democratic human rights agenda in Africa. Well, we haven't actually achieved as much as we ought to have. Nevertheless, the agenda has been clear. Democracy, human rights, etc. Now we look at what's going on. It's actually China. That's the main player. Chinese multinationals, they no longer come and say, if you want our money, you have to improve this and that regarding human rights and democracy. They come and say, we want rights for these minerals for 30 years. We want this gas or oil. What do you want? How many miles of paved roads do you need? How many houses for government ministers should we build? It's an entirely different ball game, and democracy, NGOs, human rights have very little uh, room to play in this world. 